one second. Welcome to the City of Joliet uh, Council meeting. Today's Tuesday, January 17th, 2023, here in the Council Chambers at 6.30. Uh, the invocation will be given by Pastor Jonas Jones, New Covenant Worship, Worship Center, 2423 Glenwood, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody just please stand. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy tonight, God. We thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord, of this meeting, of this council on today, Father God. Lord, we welcome your presence today, God. And Lord, we ask that you will begin to fill us with wisdom, with guidance, with understanding tonight, God. As we go forth in these proceedings and these meetings, God, Lord, we pray that, Lord, your blessings and your peace will guide us and keep us throughout this meeting tonight, God. And Lord, we release, Lord, your blessings upon the city of Joliet, God, in this state of Illinois, God, that you will continue to bring forth economic resources, continue to bring forth increase, overflow, prosperity, and new ideas and new uh, resources to come into this city, God. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, your blessings over each and every one of us, God, that you will keep us in perfect peace as we keep our minds stayed on thee, Father. And we thank you, we praise you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. We'll begin with roll call. Mayor Odekirk. Here. Councilman Clement. Here. Councilwoman Gavin. Here. Councilman Guerrero. Here. Councilman Hug. Here. Councilman Morris. Here. Councilman Mudrin. Here. Councilwoman Coleman. Here. Councilwoman Reardon. Here. First tonight, we have a proclamation honoring Plainfield South Boys Cross Country Team IHSA Class 3A State Champions. Start running. <laughs> Cross country, country, slow and steady. Come on, let's gather around here, gentlemen. We've already announced the proclamation that I will read from the mayor on behalf of the council. It's for Plainfield South High School. Nobody ever dies needs this explanation, but indulge me for just a few seconds to explain why Plainfield South High School is at Joliet City Hall. I'm a football referee. About seven or eight years ago, I was doing a freshman game on a hot Thursday afternoon. We had an extended timeout. It happened to be between Plainfield South at Plainfield South and Joliet West. We got bored waiting for the extended timeout to end. So I started ch chatting up the kids. I turned to uh, Plainfield South players and I said, what city is your, uh, is your opponents from? And they said, Joliet West, yeah, Joliet. I said, okay. Turn to Joliet West, and I said, what city is your opponents from? South, yeah, Plainfield. I went like this, they didn't know what I was doing. I pointed, what do we have on the campus there? A big, giant city of Joliet water tower. Plainfield South is one of the high schools in Joliet. Full disclosure, gentlemen, I talked to a couple of your teammates already. Both of my kids graduated from Plainfield Central. With that said, <laughs> with that said, but tonight is go, go Cougars, okay? With that said, I want to congratulate you guys. We're very proud of you. Um, <clears throat> I tried cross country in junior high for one year. 
And I have a lot of respect for you guys. I lasted almost that entire year and said, I'm done with that. I need to slow down. And I've been slowing down ever since. You guys are top athletes. With that, I will read the proclamation from Mayor Oderkirk. Whereas the Plainfield South Cougars cross country team is comprised of well-trained, outstanding athletes, you said it, who are developed to the sport of cross country and who exhibit championship character every day. Whereas on November 5th, 2022, the Plainfield South Cougars won the IHSA Class 3A Boys Cross Country State Championship at Detweiler Park in Peoria, Illinois. Whereas the Plainfield South Cougars defeated Hinsdale Central 88 to 89 to earn first place out of the 28 total teams at the IHSA State Championship. Whereas this was the first state boys cross country title won by the Plainfield South Cougars. Whereas the Plainfield South Cougars are led by their top seven of Cayman Vijay, and, and I asked these guys ahead of time, um, Dylan Maloney, BJ Storch, uh, Ethan Reynoso, Owen O'Shea, Jack Wright, Gavin Borger at the IHA State Championship, whereas Cayman Vijay, Dylan Maloney, BJ Storch, and Ethan Reynoso earned all state honors at the IHSA State Championship. Whereas Cayman Vijay, Ethan Reynoso, Owen O'Shea, and BJ Sorge earned all sectional honors at the Normal Community Sectional Championship. Whereas Cayman Vijay, BJ Sorge, Ethan Reynoso, Dylan Maloney, Owen O'Shea, Gavin Borger, and Jack Wright earned all conference honors at the Southwest Prairie Conference Championship. Whereas the success of the Running Cougars cross country team is due to the great effort put forth by all 39 members of their team who committed themselves to producing their best for Plainfield South High School and also the dedication of head coach Jason Crow and assistant coach Ryan Thompson. Whereas the Plainfield South Cougars cross country season proved to be a very successful year as they were undefeated and unbeaten against all Illinois high schools on Illinois soil throughout the IHSA cross country fall season. Now therefore, for I, Robert Oderkirk, Mayor of the City of Joliet, Illinois, on behalf of the Joliet City Council, hereby recognize Plainfield South Cougars cross country team on their outstanding season and congratulate them, congratulate the team and coaches on their IHSA Class 3A Boys Cross Country State Championship. We thank them for the positive publicity they have brought to the City of Joliet and we are all very proud of you. The city has a, a, a relatively new and very nice tradition, thanks to the city manager. We have what's called challenge coins, and there's one for each member of the team and the coaches. And it's a commemorative uh, coin, as you can see there. Um, I don't know if you want me to hand them out now. Or coach, do you want the bag? Or, okay, do you want to hand them out to me? Thank you very much. And who's going to be the spokesman other than the coach? Come on. <laughs> coach, the blue left turn's yours. I just want to thank everybody for their time and coming here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Like we said, when we go outside to the school every day, we look up at our water tower to the left of the school and it says Joliet. So I grew up in Joliet, born and raised, and uh, very proud to be here tonight. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for everything tonight, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. presentation on the Joliet Fire Department CPR and AED programs by Fire Chief Jeff Carey. Hey. Good evening. Um, tonight I'd like to give you kind of an uh, overview of all of our community risk reduction programs. This is Community Risk Reduction Week in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King for a community service. 
I almost forgot the clicker. So what is community risk reduction? It's a process to identify local risk followed by an integrated and strategic investment of resources to reduce their occurrence and impact. So how we do that is we look at all of our data throughout the year, see what kind of calls we go to most often, and then try to develop programs or ways that we can help our community by reducing those risks. The primary goal of the community risk reduction team is to work with families and individuals that face complex challenges who may need services from more than one community organization. We'll partner with these community agencies and work together to ensure families and individuals are safe, healthy, and have the opportunity to thrive. There's many resources in Will County, a lot of people just don't know how to access them. Through our CRR programs, the whole idea is to connect them with those resources. Some of the CRR programs that we're currently running, as you guys know, we've talked about a lot about the community mental health program. Um, that was one of the first programs we developed because we've seen the increasing need for mental health in our community. Since we presented that to you guys in November, from November to the end of the year, we doubled the amount of people that got into Thrivers in just that six weeks. Um, and we actually, in the last few months, we've seen an actually reduction in the percentage of our mental health ambulance calls. So it does seem like it is really starting to just take off. The community care program, that's a big program we're currently working on. Um, a big part of that has been Chrissy McNichol, the Wilk Grundy Medical Clinic, our CRR chief, John Cook, and our intern, uh, La Triviette. They've been kind of doing an outreach program in the community. And the community care program is basically we, police and fire, we're on the street every day and we're in people's homes every day. We see a lot of problems that most people don't get to see. We might be on a regular call and notice that their heat's out or maybe they're living in squalor, or maybe it's an old person that's con constantly falling. We can connect them to people who can get their heat fixed, get them grab bars, install ramps, all these basic needs, or even provide them food, by all they do is they fill out a form, it goes to our community risk reduction chief, he follows up with them, we connect them to the right community resource, and we get the basic needs of our community self. Another part of that has been the homeless program that we've been working with. Um, it's been pretty new, but we've already got a few of our homeless that into jobs, into housing, um, and then they're on their way to uh, being successful. The fire prevention programs, after the Great Recession in 2008, a lot of, throughout the United States, uh, fire prevention programs were cut. And although today we still are seeing a reduction in the number of house fires, every year since 2008 we're seeing an increase in the number of fire deaths. Today with the amount of synthetics in your house, the homes burn so much faster that without that education of people knowing what to do when there is a fire, we're seeing this increase every year in the amount of people dying of fires. So we're, we're reinstating a lot of those prevention programs in the schools to try to address those needs so everybody knows what to do when there is a fire. The fire safety inspection program we've done for years where we inspect um, mostly annually, most businesses, some every other year. We're looking to include that now into home safety surveys. These won't be required, but when we're on calls, we'll ask the homeowners if they'd like us to take a look around, identify any needs that could be a hazard in their home. Um, they could also call us anytime and sign up and we'll come out and do one. And then where the whole programs are going is into community paramedicine. Community paramedicine is, to us, will be the future of healthcare in America. With the amount of healthcare shortage that we have now with nurses, doctors, and mental health care workers, there's just not, not enough people to meet those needs. There are community paramedicine programs now where with a different training, if we start from, we can bridge that gap in that healthcare where, where it's much needed. We look at our calls, about 20% of our ambulance calls, the people don't actually need to go to the ER. With a community paramedicine program, we could solve those issues at home, saving our taxpayers thousands of dollars and the healthcare system. The main program I wanted to highlight tonight, though, was our Heart Safe Joliet program and AED program. Um, it came into light two weeks ago after the football injury to the Buffalo Bills to Mar Hamlin, and everybody's seen the importance of knowing how to use an AED and CPR. <laughs> we started this program actually in May of 2020 when we were trying to identify how we could better treat a cardiac arrest patient. In 1979, advanced cardiac life support was started in the United States and they had an 8% survival rate. Today that rate's only 10%. Also in 1979, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was one of the most deadly cancers at only a 5% survival rate. Today it's one of the most curable at 92%. Um, the AIDS epidemic was starting in America in 79 with almost a zero chance of living in today, it's almost 100%. So why has cardiac resuscitation not done anything in that same amount of time? Um, actually, a fire department who started this was actually Rialto, California. They started looking at it and wondering what was the missing pieces. They identified a few pieces, but the number one missing piece was we were doing horrible CPR. Um, too much time off the chest, nobody doing CPR before we got there. 
and we notice on our calls, we, we use entail CO2. If we're off, stop doing CPR for five or 10 minutes, you can see the acid increase in the body and the entails drop off. Without that entitle staying up, the heart gets so acidotic that no matter what we do, it's, it's, it won't survive. So early CPR and AED is a, is a huge thing. Um, so after we ch changed our, our methods, before that we were seeing about a 22% survival rate on our cardiac arrest. After May of 22, we went up to 60%, just by changing the way we did CPR. Um, then we brought in a new device last year and it got approved in this year's budget where we're changing our mechanical CPR device. With that device, we're seeing a 70% increase in survival. So um, all these other fancy stuff we have and all the medicines and all that, it was a CPR that was actually saving the lives because you're stopping that acid from getting into the, making the heart acidotic. Um, so the next year we started CPR classes. Well, we were starting, we were certifying people in CPR, which is a four hour class and was great, but we just weren't getting the numbers we needed. So that's when we came up with doing bigger groups um, and I know Councilman Clement was very active with trying to get us to get more AEDs and I talked to him a lot about this. So I'll bring up the education in a second, but that's how we started the AED CPR initiative. 30% um, of cardiac arrests are outside the home, 70% are inside. So the more people know in their home, they'll be better. But in the businesses, a town in, in Washington called Richmond, Washington, they actually have one of the best survival rates around. And what they do is they require AEDs in all their businesses. We didn't want to go with that, but we thought, what if we will offer every business in town that either buys an AED or has an AED, we'll come out and train you for free and your employees of how to use the AED. Every, for every minute that CPR is not performed, you can see there's a drop of seven to 10% in survival. We have great response times in Joliet. We're actually above the national average in response times, but it's still four to five minutes. You're already down to a 50% chance survival if nobody's doing CPR. Most of the cardiac arrests that we do have survivors, somebody's doing CPR when we get there. A lot of times it's the police officers or, or a neighbor who knows. Um, and then the, one of the biggest stats there is 90% of people who have an AED applied in that first minute survive. And that's not just survive, they actually walk out of the hospital with CPC scores of one or two. Um, and that's the whole key. We don't just want you to come back, we want you to have a, a, a CPC score of one or two means that you're gonna have a full functioning life. If it's lower than that, you're gonna have some kind of neurological deficit. So our goal is to, the more people we, AEDs we can get out there, the more people we can train in, in CPR, the, uh, the more people that we're gonna have survive cardiac arrest. And when getting to the education, here is a perfect example. In 2008, Lauren Lehman of St. Charles High School was practicing dance in her high school. She went into cardiac arrest and uh, although there was an AED available, nobody knew how to use it. So it was never applied to her and nobody did CPR for four minutes. By the time they did, she ended up dying. Um, that should have never happened. Uh, there was an AED right there, but nobody knew how. So we see that a lot in business, a lot of business that do have them, the employees aren't trained, they don't know how to use them or they're afraid to use them. So that's why we want to get into our businesses, start training the people in AED usage so this doesn't happen again. Um, and then there's a, another way, what we're doing in our inspection program this year is we're locating all the AEDs in town, putting them in our dispatch center so when somebody calls 911, our dispatchers will know where that AED is located at. But there's also something we're looking to partner with some of our local healthcare to provide some of the cost of this, is there's an app that you can get called Pulse Point. And what it does is as soon as a 911 comes into our dispatch center, anyone within a mile radius of that call who's trained in CPR gets a notification on their phone. And they can go over there and start CPR and it'll also tell them where's the closest AED at. So that's something we're looking to try to implement this year also to speed up that time so, that, so uh, we can increase our cardiac arrest survival rate. <coughs> If anyone has any other information or needs any other information on our AED, CPR, or other CRR programs, please reach out to the fire department at any time. We'll be glad to come out and provide that training for you guys. Does anyone have any questions? I do. Thank you, Chief. That was a great program, a great update. When you just mentioned about um, a, a responder looking for the closest AED, how prevalent are AEDs throughout Joliet? Are, are they in most businesses, some businesses? All public buildings? In, in most, they're in all the schools and a lot of our big box warehouses. Um, not a lot of our small businesses have them. Um, the bigger businesses do, but then the, the issue becomes they're so big, nobody knows where they're at. So that's why we want to get them into our CAD system so when the 911 calls in, they'll know right where, right where it's at. Um, the biggest issue, even with some of those stats, is even when people know where it's at, a lot of employees don't know how to use them. So we're hoping to get out with these businesses and, and train them. Um, we do have like some of the big box warehouses that don't have them. 
even when we get there quick, those warehouse so big, it takes us five minutes to get to the patient. So in training those employees of knowing how to use them where they're at will really speed up that time. Thank you. Yes. Is there an average uh, cost that the business can budget for? for an, an, AD? an average AD is about $1,500 in AD. Um, we've talked to some of our manufacturers to see if we made a big purchase, if they would reduce that. Um, I haven't got many answers yet on that, but it's something we were looking. I talked with Cosmo Clement about it also, maybe coming up with some kind of program where we could share a cost or reduce costs or get some donors to donate so many a year that then we can give to certain businesses. Mayor. Yes. Would there be any grants out there for this? There, there's an AFG grant right now. I just emailed them today to X. It's a lot of it's for fire departments. I, the question I asked them was, would we be able to use it for this program? And um, I just emailed them today to find out. And one more thing I might add that happened to me. Tell the folks that get these, do not put them in a locked box because we needed it and no one had the key. Yeah. So that was not very good. And the outcome was okay, but it could have been a disaster. Yeah, absolutely. Two questions. One, uh, where would you purchase one? There's a, a store I like called the AED store, actually, that you can buy them from. Um, in Joliet, we use Zoll products, but it doesn't, it could be any product. Um, but there is, if you go to a, either a CPR Plus or AED store, they have all kinds of them on there. No, there was an AED, AED store. Is, yeah. Now, if you use it, is that it? You have to purchase a new one? What happens? No, the, the AED is good for probably 20 years. Oh, um, wow. The Zola, the good thing about the Zola is they just take D cell batteries that you can change out. Some of the other ones have a battery. Once it's dead, then you got to change the whole thing. But uh, that's a good thing about the Zola is it just takes regular, regular D batteries. Um, the pads do expire every four years, so that's part of the, our program is we're going to check to make sure everything's up to date and so they can purchase new pads. Thank you. Good job, yeah. Chief. Okay. Good job, Chief. Very good. Thank you, Chief. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For anybody that doesn't know what an AED is, we have one right out here. You can take a peek at it. But uh, we have them all throughout the building. So. Right. Might eat it tonight, huh, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Police Chief Bill Evans will present on crime stats. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the 2022 uh, crime stats and give you a little update on, on, on what we've learned. Uh, first of all, everybody always asks the question, is crime up in Joliet? Um, uh, crime is up in some areas slightly, and it's down in some areas slightly. Uh, anytime I have this conversation with anybody, anybody always asks me about the homicide totals. Uh, that seems to be the most prevalent uh, question. Uh, the homicides were up last year uh, by a very small percentage. Uh, we had seven last year. Um, but compared to 19 and 20, it's considerably down. Um, so uh, that's good news. Hopefully we can continue to bring that number down. Um, we have uh, a decrease in criminal sexual assaults in the city. We have a de decrease in robberies in the city, uh, about 24% uh, decrease in robberies in the city of Joliet. Uh, we also have a decrease in aggravated assaults in the city. Uh, burglaries was slightly up, but not by much. Uh, motor vehicle theft, uh, fortunately, is down. It's down about 13%. And I, I credit the flock cameras for doing their job and our sharing with the outside agencies that surround Joliet with, uh, with uh, uh, that reduction. All in all, violent crimes in the city of Joliet are actually down 2%. We went from about 706 violent crimes last year in 21 and uh, 692 in the uh, 2022 year, uh, which is actually fairly decent in my estimation considering there's about 151,000 people living in Joliet and the daytime population is enormous with all the businesses and all the traffic that goes through Joliet. So it's considerably higher than 151,000 during the daytime during the week. One area we did see a little bit of increase in, actually a lot of increase in, was uh, bank transactions. A lot of people, especially the older uh, community, is still using checks. Uh, they're mailing checks to various places. Those checks are being intercepted at the U.S. Post Office and other other, uh, other venues, and they're being washed and cashed. 
So if you do have an older person in your family, uh, maybe see if we can't talk them out of uh, using uh, the actual checks because they are being intercepted, they're being washed, and then they're being reused for higher amounts. So that's something we saw a pretty drastic increase in. Some of the other financial crimes are down. Uh, credit card fraud was a little bit up. Uh, that's what's reported to us. Sometimes those things don't always go reported. Uh, so, and just keep in mind the financial crimes are very detailed and very complex and they're not always immediately solved. I know that all of you know about our PPP loan investigation we did a few months ago where we uh, arrested 25 people for fraudulent PPP loans and some other uh, uh, violations, uh, financial violations. So we are on top of it. Uh, as far as our enforcement, uh, Mr. O'Connor wrote a, an interesting article today uh, about the recruitment efforts. Uh, we are moving forward with hiring police officers. We've hired 40 last year. So we are definitely keeping, uh, keeping pace with that. And I think uh, more police officers on the street will uh, also provide a little bit of reduction in uh, street crimes. And once again, we're down, violent crimes is down about 2% in the city. Uh, as a police department, we have a couple of initiatives. One, I'm hoping we can get up probably within the next two to four weeks. Uh, that'll be coming as an enforcement initiative to help curb violent crime in the city. And then we have another one planned for the spring. Uh, my philosophy is and always will be proactive policing uh, uh, stops crimes before they happen. I don't care what anybody tells you, I've been doing this a long time, it makes a difference. So that's gonna be the focus of our agency over the next year. Um, and I'd also like for you to know, we, we recovered 263 weapons off the street last year. 263 firearms off the street in the city of Joliet. Our homicide clearance rate is at 57%, which is higher than the national average. And I think that number will probably go up a little bit because uh, the detectives are still working last year's homicide. So um, that is my report at this time. If there's anybody who has any questions, uh, please uh, fire away. Well, Chief, thank you. I invite you to come forward. I, I, this is good news, especially in light of what's happening all over the country around us, other communities in Illinois that have seen a, a real spike in crime, and that hasn't happened here in Joliet. So great job to you, to the men and women who work for you. Thank you for coming forward. Are there any questions here in the council? No, I would just make the comment, if, if you don't mind, Mayor, that I, 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 I echo your sentiments. You know, nationally, we look at it, we look at the national news, and, and then everybody feels like it's happening everywhere. So this was a breath of fresh air. Well, the police department will continue, and the community will, to, to reduce those numbers that I, I, I am, I'm sure of. Yeah, we're, we're going to continue to and stay We're, we're doing a great it, job. And uh, we're going to do some innovative things in the next year to help curb by the crime in the city. Well, that's why we, we have to make sure that we continue to focus on funding, and not just funding and manning the police department, providing them with the right tools so that they're not out-tooled. Correct, sir. So. I would agree. Thank you, Chief. Great job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as written with the following change? Table Council Memo 37-23 to the April 18th Council Meeting. Council Memo 37-23 is the public hearing and the resolution approving the First Amendment to the annexation agreement for 620 Sandall Place and 800 Richard Street. So moved. Second. So, motion and seconded to approve the agenda as written and table Council Memo 37-23, the public hearing and the resolution to the April 18th Council meeting. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Before I vote, I just want to let folks know that are here for this one. This is about the blasting of the quarry. It's being tabled, so I know you're all here, so you might want to go home because we're not going to discuss it tonight, unfortunately, for you. But I'll vote yes to the table. Councilwoman Reardon? Yes. Aye. Motion carried. Next is the citizens to be heard on agenda items. So anyone that would like to speak on an agenda item, this would be the appropriate time. First is Robert Neft. I'll wait until the matter comes up. So this would be the time to speak if you want to address the council. I'm going to come back. Okay. Tom Osterberger. I don't know. 
Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tom Osterberger, 111 North Ottawa Street, Joliet, Illinois. I'm here on uh, item number 4623. I won't bore you. You have such a long agenda. Uh, I'm here in objection to the petition for the expansion of a used car lot on Center Street. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. There are several other objectors here. Uh, I represent the property that is adjacent to the existing car uh, sales facility. They're looking to jump over my client's property and expand their facility around them. So I'll leave it at that. I don't think it's appropriate, but we're here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Talmager. Yeah. Pat Wojtek. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Pat Wojtek. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Sauce and Arnold Schoenbeck. I am here for item number 4623. I represent First Choice Auto Sales, and the owner, Mr. Shabani, is here with me tonight. I'm going to speak next. Uh, First Choice Auto Sales is currently located at 201 North Center Street. It is a relatively small lot uh, with parking for both inventory and customers there. In 2021, Mr. Shabani uh, had an opportunity to purchase the lot just two doors down at 115 North Center Street to use as additional parking for his inventory. Also in 2021, he applied for and was granted a permit to build a fence around the property to keep the vehicle safe. And now we're before you for our application of special use to use this lot as a parking. Several conditions were attached to uh, this item, um, which Mr. Shabani is prepared to adhere to which is to only use this as parking of inventory of his cars. This is not going to be an extension of his, of his business. His lot is currently um, pretty congested. Um, customers come in and oftentimes don't have uh, places to park on the lot itself at 201. So they're forced to park on Oneida Street and Center Street. This will reduce that uh, congestion on those two streets. In addition, when an inventory is delivered to the location, uh, trucks have to come in off of Oneida Street and back in, flatbed trucks and deliver the vehicles there. Having this alternate location two doors down, the entryway is actually off the alley, and um, this will allow the trucks to deliver safely off of Center Street, off of the alley, into the lot, parking the inventory there. Um, the, uh, the lot at 115 Center Street would only have 16 spaces. Um, uh, uh, two other conditions I think that are important that were attached to this and we're more than happy to comply with is that the current asphalt lot is in, in pretty poor shape, uh, beaten up a little bit, uh, and that's all gonna be replay, repaved, so it'll be a nice new blacktop all uh, yellow lines for the 16 spaces. In addition to the city sidewalk and the city apron right in front of the alley, uh, concrete is all torn up as well. And that's another condition is all that is going to be replaced by the owner. Uh, it's gonna have a nice new appearance off of Center Street. Um, uh, if people may re recall, and this is in the uh, agenda notes from the, the zoning board meeting, that there was a Kinney Motors that operated across the street from here. And that's this parking lot was for that use and, and hasn't been used, I don't, we don't think, of anything other than a parking lot this entire time. So there's a consistency here. This the use, pro proposed use is consistent with that. And really the, the main objector to it is the bar owner that's in between the two locations. Uh, he wanted to use this parking lot for his own business, but he, he can't, right? This is not his lot, this is my, our, our lot. Um, but we were engaged in negotiations with Mr. Osterberger to potentially do, get some sort of an arrangement to allow bar patrons to park there in addition to using it for inventory. Unfortunately, those, those broke apart. Um, but we're here tonight just to ask for your uh, consideration and hopefully approval of this item. We're available for any questions. Should you have any when this comes up on our agenda item? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bujar <coughs> Shabani. Good evening. My name is Briar Shabani, and my address is 704 Silver Fire Drive in Joliet. I live in Joliet for 23 years, and uh, I'm landlord too. I own some properties in Joliet, Crest Hill, Plainfield, and I never have an issue with the city or with nobody. I keep everything nice and clean. And I used to work in a Joliet Casino for 20 years, and I used to drive on the Center Street every night. The lot with my dealership now there used to be vacant for a couple years and used to be like really in a bad condition after I moved there. Now I put the lights there, I have a cameras all over my building, and I feel more comfortable. I see neighbors walking with the kids there, walking with the dog, they feel more safe there. And uh, I keep real good inventory there. I have like real good cars there, like up to $50,000 car. And most of my customers, 60%, they come from the different states there. 
and I'm trying to do something good for myself and good to look for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Larry Crawford. Edna Brass. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, at least. Yes, I am here to speak on 3723, although I understand it's been tabled, but we get to speak. And I am uh, a homeowner, and I have experience living through blasting in a quarry uh, for several years. And I think that um, starting blasting in that quarry would be detrimental to the quality of life to the citizens. I have lived for several years with cracks in my wall and um, that can't be repaired or once repaired that they occur again. I've lived with doors being off-centered as a result of um, blasting in the quarry. I've lived with my entire house shaking as a result of blasting in the quarry. And if there's gonna be an increase in truck traffic, that is a concern because I also live in Lairway School District and the trucks, the increase in traffic, and I re, and at, because of the increase in traffic, every time a siren would go off before Lairway actually moved their school building, there was panic because there was a fear that one of the school buses was in an accident with the children on the bus. And so if there's gonna be an increase in truck traffic, that's another concern if they're going to blasting. And we also have students who walk to school who would be um, not as safe if there's gonna be an increase in truck traffic. And the blasting is also within just a less than a mile of two school buildings. And so I, I am concerned about any structural damage in that that would occur because of blasting in that quarry. So thank you. Thank you. Larry Crawford. Okay. Larry Crawford, 613 North Hickory here in Joliet. I'm, I'm also, I know that that item has been uh, 3723 has been tabled, but my concern is um, as I've looked at the information that has been provided, it poses questions that uh, I don't know who's providing that information, but it didn't answer those questions either. It said, what is, what is the blast? How does it harm? How does it harm or doesn't harm? And it's a yes and no questions, but the, the, the response to the questions that, that it's provided is just simply information rather than yes or no. And I think uh, as a lawyer, you, you know how simple uh, getting to the point is in terms of asking a question. And I don't think that that uh, information that's been provided is sufficient for somebody, for this council to make an intelligent de decision about what that blasting is about. The other item in there is that there's something about a 600 feet proposal and all evidence and testimony will be presented under oath. Um, I, that's pretty interesting uh, preface in terms of providing some limitations for my concern as, a, as someone who doesn't live within 600 feet of uh, the blasting as it might be. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the limitations in terms of who you say is qualified to address concerns that go way beyond those 600 feet. So as you're preparing to, uh, I'm glad that you're tabling it, but I'm, I'm, I would wish that you would make sure that the questions that people really have, you have real, have real answers to rather than a speculative uh, notion as it might be that the person who's probably uh, going to be the beneficiary of this may have provided to you. That's how it appears to me, like the person who wants this is said, here's what, here's what you do to persuade Larry to go for it. Both of us, Larry. <laughs> so I, I, would, I would say that, well, d do your homework well and come with something more concrete, but I think that there are more reasons not to allow that than there are uh, justifications for why you would allow uh, some uh, blowing up or explosive or dynamiting to occur that in that area. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. Um, just to, to clarify too, that we're not doing it, but the public hearing 
would probably address the very issues that you're bringing up. That would be the opportunity for the, the I understand. petition I understand. to present their argument, for the yeah. council to ask questions, for the public to ask questions and try to vet the issue. So, but yeah. we well, I'm, I'm just, I just, I, I knew that it was being tabled, but I just wanted to indicate that to you because I have the privilege to do that. Very good. Thank you for allowing me to do so. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council on an agenda item? Um, that you said your East Side Neighborhood Council. And it looks like you guys are doing, you know, homework, and that's my hope and my prayer that you guys, you know, would do that. And the effects of, know the effects of this uh, blasting that would take place at this quarry. And so many people have already stated, you know, the area and where it um, is located and the potential problems that um, it will cause. So uh, we're asking you to have the best interest of the quality of life for the people that's in that area, people that live on the east side of Joliet, where this blasting would take place. Right now, you are our, you are our voice. And, um, we're asking you to consider what's best for the residents on the east side of Joliet, where this will be um, happening. And um, I would just like to end with a quote, well, two quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It says, injustice anywhere is a, fit, is a threat to justice everywhere. And the last one is, give us the ballots, and we will fill the legislative halls with men of goodwill. Thank you. Thank you. Next person that would like to speak. There were a few that stood up before. Good evening, council members and everybody present. I am grateful that you are table minutes for further discussion and input. But my main question of it is, when you establish this public hearing, are we going to still deal with the fact of you only notifying people within that 600 feet rule? This affects people outside of that rule. Are they going to be properly notified? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I am Boise Walker, also coming to uh, discuss some questions that are still on the table for the blasting. Uh, specifically, um, and I know that you guys are going to have experts who are going to come and speak at that next meeting at the public hearing, but I am asking that you bring in a third party expert who is unbiased, who will be able to bring in that information to us and answer questions. And I'm also asking that you really take into consideration how close it is, and it's already been said, how close it is to schools, but also in the backyard of a nursing home, Sunny Hill. I also want to ask the question of what impact is it going to have on the water table and the condition of the water for the individuals who have wells. Also wanted to ask if the explosives will impact not just the neighboring residents, but the, built, the businesses as well. So I already mentioned Sunny Hill, but the schools are also there. And one thing that we are currently, the city is currently working on is the highway. It's very in very close proximity to the highway. It's going to have impacts. And 
one of the questions that I think may have been asked, but maybe not, is 600 feet is a standard for sending out information to let individuals know about what is going to happen with public meetings. But how far are the tremors going to travel? If it's further than 600 feet, what I am calling the blasting impact zone, and that's my terminology, I don't know if it's a correct terminology, but that blasting zone, however far those tremors will travel, those are the individuals who should be included in the public meeting and notified of that public meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. I'm here tonight as president of Cunningham Neighborhood Council, and I'm in support of our sister East Side Neighborhood Council. I support their position, position on not allowing blasting in the quarry located off the Richard Street and Sandal Place. Yes, the quarry has been there since the 1800s, and hydraulic uh, rock crushing has been there and working just fine. Now all of a sudden, over 100 plus years later, the new owners want to do a mass, uh, mass production of uh, aggregate for PT Ferro Company. <coughs> Only fools would believe that two schools, Sunny Hill Nursing Home, local wells, local residence home, that are so close to the quarry won't be affected by blasting. In the last 15 years, I've had two major projects on Center Street and Joliet. One of them was the separation of the rainwater from the city sewers. <clears throat> when that excavator gets banging on that ground with the teeth to rip that asphalt up in the concrete, my house shakes, the pictures on the wall shake, and I've got cracks in my foundation, it's a cinder block foundation in front of my house that I had to fix. And then, years later, we got the water mains put in. And the same thing happened. I had to patch up the same cracks from the foundation of that pounding of that backhoe on that asphalt and on that concrete. Now, if it does it to my area, which is just 15, 20 feet from the roadway, what's it going to do to the surrounding areas of when you're using blasting? But the excavator starts tearing up the road and hammering. As that's light compared to the blasting that's going to take place. But yet, you want us to believe that the blasting of quarry rock, quarry rock, rock with explosives won't do the same. We don't buy that story. The real story is that when people vote for a councilman or a mayor of our city, they are choosing the one they feel will listen to the taxpayers of their district or the city. But on the east side and the south side, that doesn't happen. Time after time, the city votes and dumps crap on the east side and south side of Joliet with no regards to their feeling or what they would like to see. They are destroying that part of town. Just look at the warehouse traffic and you see what has been done to the area. On April 4th, come April 4th, these same people will be out in force to vote for somebody that will listen to their concerns and take into consideration when it comes time to dump more crap on the east side and south side of Joliet. When it comes to projects in another part of our city, some of you council persons that sit up there have said you cannot support the project because your residents do not want it in their area. But ye, why can't you listen to residents of the east side and south side when they say the same thing on projects in their neighborhood? Enough is enough. These folks need the same quality of life as the rest of Joliet. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to wait for public comments since this was tabled, but I might as well speak now. Well, yeah, you know, let, let me say something. Thank, thank you for the comments. It, this isn't on the agenda, and it wasn't on the agenda for a vote. It was out for a public hearing. So I think there's some people um, want to make political points here, but the reality is this is all part of the process that the council had to come to make a decision. Right, so I, I'm not going to cut off, it, No, I won't cut off the comments, but um, it's premature. I think the one gentleman knew that, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, anyway, uh, I've seen this uh, matter in the press and whatnot, and uh, since I'm running for District 5, a lot of people have asked me about that, and I don't really have any information to give them. I emailed the quick supply company and said, hey, I'm like, the information that's available on the city website is pretty bland, pretty generic. I said, can you tell me what kind of blast medium are you going to use? Are you going to use dynamite? Are you going to use C4? How much of those elements are you going to use? Uh, will it be multiple blasts? You know, they gave me the... Again, they said, go to the city hall and get that information there. They weren't real forthcoming about that, so that made me suspicious. Uh, 
and there's questions that aren't even answered. Sonic damage is a big boom that's gonna shake windows, older houses that way, plaster and stuff, older foundations. So I asked them too, I'm like, are you gonna put up any type of bond or insurance? I said, if you're swearing to God that this is great and safe, then put something up. Guarantee these people that live within 600 feet or a mile or whatever, say, hey, if, if we break your windows or knock your doors off your hinges, we're gonna take care of you. I got no answers right that. So I'd like to ask them for me and for you guys to get those answers to them, make them put stuff in writing. Say, we're gonna use, you know, 20 pounds of dynamite and uh, we'll put up a, a bond or a surety and say, hey, if, if we break windows, break walls or whatever, we're gonna take care of you. So please do, do the best research. I trust you guys to do that, but please get the answers from them. And like someone said, maybe find a third party that doesn't have a, a vested financial interest in this and get the correct answers and then vote with what you received there. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. I too was on the agenda for um, just general public comments. My name is Amy Sanchez. I'm a resident of Joliet and I am speaking on the blasting as well. And I just ask in reference to public um, hearing that you also take into consideration HUD's request for the high concentrated, um, high minority concentration areas. Um, also taken into consideration for the public hearing. Um, the quality of life plan that is, although dated, was used up until a few years ago to receive CDGB funding for said communities and said areas. Uh, many of us here that were on the quality of life task force or quality of life plan or different things for the quality of life as spoken to tonight. Um, the first proposal or recommendation that the prior administration accepted was that we use specifically the South Side comprehensive, um, comprehensive plan, as well as leading practices of the lead leadership in energy and environmental design. So we ask that, that all that be taken into consideration and that um, a HUD qualified environmental impact study be done for this set area about the impacts and the ramifications that will happen in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Megan Cooper, Joliet. I was conflicted on whether or not to even get up here and to speak because a lot of you know my voice by now, you know my face. Time and time again, we have been down here and what we are asking for, we're not asking for anything more, but what we're not gonna accept is anything less. And with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, when you said that the gentleman before was premature was speaking, he spoke the truth. And he spoke the truth that a lot of people on this council may not want to hear. The south and east side of Joliet is neglected and no, we are not treated fairly as other parts in Joliet. So no, he was not premature. He doesn't stay on that side of town, but it takes somebody from the other side of town to open up their eyes and realize that we are being discriminated against on that side of town and we are your dumping ground. So no, that was not premature. That's just some things that you may not want to hear, but it's the truth. And come April, I heard that this is going to go on to April. This is everyone in this building and everybody that's listening. This is your opportunity to change things in Joliet if you don't like the way that it's going. Because the South east side and the south side of Joliet. From these day forward, we will be heard. You might not want to hear us, and you may say that it is premature, but we will be heard. Because in order for this to get as far as what it did, this had to go through Joliet staffing. And if this was on any other side of town, they would have asked for third party to come in and do an independent evaluation and not just go off of what a company is experts is saying. What about these people that have groundwater? We all know what happens with quarries. They pump out water. Have we learned anything from this other walking material? Um, the other walking material place over here? They've changed the water table over there. A lot of the people in this area, they actually have to rely on well water. And what happens when their wells go dry? Who's going to pay for it? What's going to happen to their property? Are they not? Are they going to have to then pay to be tapped into the city of Joliet because now they don't have any well water? Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to actually look after these kids that is literally a little bit more than a half of a mile away from 
from a blasting area. And we just heard one lady sit up here and say, well, they're away school every time that that sirens go off, the panic that kids have. If this is what you want for the city of Joliet and its children, is to have blasting within such close proximity to schools, what is this going to do to their education? You might as well go ahead and set them up to work for North Point or Center Point because they're not going to get the education that they need. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to address the council on an agenda item. Good evening, council. Um, I too was um, reluctant to come up today, but I, I, I just have one point and I'm nervous in saying it takes a lot of time to prepare for these public hearings. The amount of work that goes in to research and read and find out information, we do that when, the, when the hearing is scheduled. This was tabled the last time so that experts could be here and we could ask questions. And again, respectfully, as respectfully as I possibly can, I just, I'm irritated though <laughs> that this hearing now is postponed until after the election. I'm irritated. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Frank Fehrenbacher. Uh, my family owns 407, 409. Jefferson Street, and I've come to talk tonight about the car lot that uh, they want to have you approve uh, as a second car lot. I'm not sure that I know of any places in Joliet here that has a satellite lot without a building on it. I think you might be setting a precedence if you go ahead and vote for this. Also, the owner uh, would use the back of our building for photography and three times uh, one of my tenants could not get in there to uh, utilize his space, open his garage door because uh, the owner's photographer was taking pictures of his cars. And I, he called me, the tenant called me and said, sir, uh, come back in 15, 20 minutes. I'm in the process of photographing vehicles, uh, you'll have to wait a little bit. And this happened twice, and I got on the phone and talked to the owner and told him that, you know, unless you want to give me a car for a year to use, or you want to rent the place out, that's fine, but stay off the property. There's a Dick's towing sign there. But uh, I guess people just don't, uh, you know, don't like or don't want to ask about going on other people's property from that part of it. And now tonight I hear from the attorney that they're going to pull their trucks in there, uh, their low boys or whatever you call them, so they can drop the vehicles off in the alleyway. So uh, right now uh, there's a lot of vehicles from the apartment buildings on Oneida Street and on Nicholson Street and on Jefferson Street that use that alley. You know, is it going to be 10 minutes? Is it going to be a half hour uh, that the trailer is going to park in the alleyway so they can drop off the vehicles and load the vehicles onto their trailers on public property? I know I see it from time to time on Jefferson Street out there uh, by Menards. They pull in the middle of it, and it's an accident waiting to happen. But you know, now they're bringing it on to the other property owners here if this goes through. So I'm asking you to deny the uh, uh, vote for the uh, property tonight to make it into a used car lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on an agenda item? I think I'll move. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How long? 
And as I stand before the council, my name is Sarah Broadnax, 504th Avenue. My councilman, Jerry Morris. And for all the rest of you that are councilmen, when you invite the pastor or pastors to pray, evidently you're not hearing what they're praying. They're asking God to lead you and guide you so you can make the right decisions for your neighbor. We are your neighbors. Scripture says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. What do you want for your family? And Jan, you're always talking about quality. Do you really know what quality of life is? So you need to go and think tonight, all of you, when the pastors come down and pray, what do God require? And then you ask us to vote for you. So I tell people, make your decision tonight. If the Marinim table stuff, they do it for a reason. So some people are bought and paid for, but God is not bought and paid for. And you will stand before him and answer. So I say to people, come April, don't vote for him. Choose somebody else. Give somebody else a chance to mess up or do right. <laughs> Our east side, we don't have grocery stores. We have trucks running up and down and doing things. So I'm saying, when you ask the pastor, and if I was a pastor and stood before you and prayed for you, I would ask God to convict all of y'all and let the handwriting be on the wall and you be found guilty. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak on an agenda item? Good evening. I'd just like to confirm, um, I'm here on behalf of the self-storage facility that's on the agenda tonight. Is that something that I have to come up and speak about now or will I be called up later? For you address the council, you can do it now. I can do it now, yep. okay. Yeah, I'm here on behalf of the self-storage uh, facility that we'd like to build over on Cass Street. Um, 1735 Cass, it's a 6.7 acre parcel that uh, we went through the Zoning Board of Appeals and got a unanimous approval there to move forward with our, um, we were proposing a zoning change from B3 business with a special use permit for indoor self-storage. <clears throat> um, if you'd like me to go through all the details on the facility and everything else uh, as it goes, I, I can, uh, if, if, if you wanna hear all those. Uh, Are there any questions? Regarding this? Okay. You want me to go through it or? No, the, okay. the council has questions they can ask you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Glad to take any questions if there are any questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else would like to speak on an agenda item? That will move on to appointments. First, the mayor is recommending Greg Pierbolt and Emily Brzezicki be appointed to the Arts Commission. Is there a motion to approve? No move. Second. And motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Fullman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Motion carried. Next, Mayor Odekirk is recommending Quinn Adamowski be reappointed to the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. 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 Motion seconded to approve. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Motion carried. Next, Mayor Odekirk is recommending Ken Spiegel be reappointed to the Historic Preservation Commission and making him a voting member. A motion to approve. So moved. Second. And motion seconded to approve. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? <coughs> Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Motion carried. Next on the agenda are council committee reports. First is the finance committee report. 
Finance Committee met today in the Council Chambers at 5.30. Uh, present were myself, Councilman Clement, and Councilwoman Reardon, along with city staff. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, so we concluded our monthly financial report for uh, December of 2022, bringing the fiscal year to an end. Uh, although, as the last month in the year, there's going to be uh, a number of items that will be um, corrected as, as we're tallying the final numbers for the total fiscal year. And so uh, some of these numbers will be adjusted um, through, through January as we uh, continue to pay back some, some accounts um, as we are accounting for uh, payments that came in, payments that went out during December but haven't been uh, totaled yet. So uh, in our general fund, uh, there hasn't been too much of a change from the last few months. We are at $20 million more in revenue uh, compared to last year, of which uh, $7.4 million come from income taxes, $5.7 million from the development fee, uh, $1.6 million in sales taxes, and $1.8 million in building permits. Uh, expenses are up compared to last year by roughly 7.6 million, uh, the bulk of which comes from uh, an increase in employee costs. Uh, there were a lot of retroactive contract payments that went out. Um, we are showing at, at this moment a roughly a $20 million surplus, but again, as these numbers become finalized for the end of the fiscal year, uh, we're anticipating that, that number to come down some, uh, but we can still reasonably expect a $10 million surplus. Uh, water and sewer revenues are 7% higher than they were compared to this time last year. Uh, with the uh, That's attributable to the increases in rates, um, but otherwise uh, normal according to historical trends. We have uh, for our invoices, $32 million total, of which $1 million uh, was the uh, largest and, and most notable payment that was made to the Illinois Department of Transportation for improvements at the Rock Run Crossing. Uh, travel expenses were normal. Uh, personnel report, we have 21 open positions. Uh, of note would be the possibility, and this is yet to be finalized, but the possibility of hiring two, possibly more, uh, inspectors to cover the additional workload for the uh, rental inspection program. Or Sherry, you missed anything? No. And that would conclude my report. Next is Land Use and Legislative Committee report. <coughs> yes, uh, excuse me. We, uh, the committee, uh, we met last Wednesday here in the Council Chamber about 4 o'clock. The Land Use and Legislative Committee, myself, along with Councilman Clement and Councilwoman Quillman, uh, Christy McNichols, she had a few agenda items. They were all uh, uh, concerning the CDBG funding that uh, we received from HUD. Uh, I had asked Mr. Regis, who was in attendance at the meeting, to kind of go through um, some of the updates that she shared with us. I will. Thank you, Councilman Morris. Hi, everybody. So, like Councilman Morris said, this meeting was all about CDBG funding. That's community development block grant funding. That's HUD money that the city gets to either spend on certain qualifying public improvement projects or to help qualifying not-for-profit organizations meet some of their costs. As is required by HUD regulations, we did the fiscal year 2021 consolidated annual performance evaluation that was presented and reviewed by the committee. And we also talked about our strategy moving forward with additional CDBG funding. And part of what city staff would like to do is have greater uh, public participation in how those monies are allocated and spent by the city and also have greater accounting for monies um, that are not spelled, spent. For example, sometimes an organization will get a block of money to fix a certain project and they'll come in under budget and there will be leftover money. Well, that leftover money can be reallocated to other projects if we catch it in time. So we're going to make greater effort to account for those monies and we can timely spend them and properly allocate them and have greater public participation and that was our meeting. Yeah. I, I just like to point out, I, I think and maybe the committee, I think if 
if you have anything else uh, to add after this, uh, was the participation from the other organizations. Because a lot of times organizations come to me after the funding has been let or now uh, Chrissy and, and the staff is going to try to reach out early on to, to bring them in. So again, we'll be getting new or other organizations that not-for-profit organizations that can benefit from some of this funding with the, the, the new uh, program that they're gonna, the staff is going to put out. Joe, Jan. Well, not only that, Terry, but we did distribute some of those fundings on the east side. The World Running Medical Clinic, and there was a couple, I don't have a list in front of me. Do you know if you um, Chris? Spanish Center. Spanish Center, and there was one more, I thought. I, I, I don't have a list in front of me, but we were accused tonight of not giving any money to East Side, but that was not true. No, I, I, I don't think that's what we were accused of, man, but it's okay. Okay. It's all right. We're going to be fine. I can't, I, I, it was another one, too. There was another one. I, I had it in my notes. I know. But anyway, yeah, and it's going to be, uh, again, the new the participation of the uh, new, uh, anyway, there's I more to, say There's new, more to but, come. There's right. more to come, more funds to be distributed. That's right. what we're working on. I mean, they're going to get the word out to organizations, not for profit, mm -hmm. early on, so they can submit their uh, information to receive some of these fundings from uh, HUD. The CDB, I always have a hard time with that. C, I'm reading it too, CDBG <laughs> funding. <laughs> I don't know, them letters always get me, but yeah, so, that's it, so. I can answer your question, Councilwoman Fulman, for East Side recipients mm -hmm. of uh, a funding list, and again, this is just East Side, uh, Salvation Army, Forest Park Community Center, Collins Street Park, Forest Park, the Boys and Girls Club, Parks Avenue Infrastructure, and that's all that's specifically allocated, but there's a lot of general public funding that goes to the East Side as well. Thank you, I just, I knew it was long, I could only take two on top of my head, but there we go. Yep, thank you. Joe, you good? <clears throat> That's it, man. Thank you. Public Service Committee report. Okay, my time to shine. Uh, the Public Service Committee met today at 4.30 here at City Hall in the council chambers. In attendance and on the committee is Councilwoman Gavin, Councilman Morris, myself. Also in attendance was Allison Swisher, Director of Public Utilities, and Greg Reddy, Director of Public Works, and several staff members. And it was a eh, relatively short agenda. You know, under contracts, we looked at uh, uh, three contracts. One is a, spe a specialized piece of equipment we need, a lift, a portable lift, so we can work on the new ambulances that we'll be buying, because we've switched from the International to Ford um, platform. So, you know, they, they, for several different reasons, not the least of which was availability. Um, International is oh, more than a year or a year and a half. And the Ford meets, after a review by both MMD and, and the fire department, meets the, the fire department's needs better and therefore the citizens of Joliet. Uh, we looked at an emergency repair on a well, um, which was a $51,818 bill. Uh, we also looked at the Water Quality Compliance Analytical Testing Service, um, again from the sewer department, uh, and we looked at the three companies that would, would, would do the water quality and testing um, for our water and sewer department moving forward. All three of those items were seen, uh, seen to be in order, made a lot of sense, and they were unanimously approved by the council for a recommendation to this, uh, by the committee, I'm sorry, for a recommendation to this full council to approve. We have four items on the change order pass, some final payments. Um, you know, one was a, a credit back for $4,200 and, uh, and some change on a uh, sanitary sewer re rehabilitation project. Um, another one was, for the most part, balancing, like for instance, there was a $42,150 addition to the uh, east side um, sidewalk and curb replacement project to balance out uh, new uh, aggregates and, and, and levels. In other words, they, they needed more material than originally estimated. So we looked at the four items and find them, found them to make perfect sense and uh, scrutinized them. And again, all four got a unanimous approval by all three members of this committee to send it forward to this council suggesting and recommending approval. For anyone living in Heritage Lake Estates, if you're watching, you will be getting your multi-way stop sign at Heritage Lake Drive, Lake, Lake Woods Drive, and in the, at the intersection with Legacy Drive 
Um, anybody living there already knows this, but no, that's not another Six Corners in Joliet. Heritage Lake Drive and Lakewood Drive are the same road, and at that stop sign, they change names. Um, so it's a T, and so those living in the Heritage Lake Estates, you are getting your uh, three-way stop so that it will be safer for your community. Then we had, and they'll be back um, because we have to change something in our ordinance in the way that we deliver um, certain contracts. And I'll make this very basic because we'll go over it again in February and Allison Swisher will be here. But essentially, it was a technical thing. We have a bunch of moving parts for the first phase of our um, alternative water, Chicago water, as some call it, project uh, up in Chicago in a park. Working with the park district, you know, the, the, the Chicago Park District, working with the city of, Jolie, uh, of Chicago, working with the residents that live in a very, very residential area around that park. And instead of having three separate contracts bid, where well, we then would have to referee those three to make sure that the overlaps didn't delay the project, because we don't have in our tenure um, uh, time frame a lot of room to get delay. We're doing a different system of delivery, as they call it, for contracts where one person There'll be a number of uh, proposals given, and you know, the proposal will be chosen. We'll give a maximum cost that they have to stay within, and then they would bid out to the other uh, three contractors for the specialized, whether it be the pipe versus the pump, because there's certain specialized things. Long story short, that is to ensure we don't incur delays. It's a more efficient way. Our, um, as I refer to them, over-the-shoulder consulting firm that's standing back and watching the whole project, thought it was a great idea. Um, I did too. I think so did Terry and Betty. We discussed it at length. And uh, to do it, though, that type of contract letting is not allowed under our current ordinance from many, many years ago, so we need to change that in February. Um, if there's a, a deeper questions into this, certainly you can ask us tonight, but certainly let's wait and have a presentation from Allison, a briefer presentation than what we received today. We did, let, we, we, we did watch the presentation, listen to the presentation from the consultant, and it makes sense, because we know that time is critical in our, our alternative water, and you know we're solving the problem. We don't have to worry about running out of water like we did for some 30 years, and we don't want to delay it, and we want to minimize any possibility of any delay, and no, this will not add any cost to the actual project itself. It's just a different way to deliver the product and services. Only in the Chicago park, if you will, portion of the project, the rest of the project will be managed traditionally. And I think that's everything. Did I have anything, miss anything, Terry or Betty? I don't think so. No, sir, you covered everything. All right. With that said then, Mayor, I would have to say that's my committee report. Thank you. I shall no other reports. Moving on under consent agenda, approval of the minutes. It's recommended the minutes of the council meeting held on January 3rd, 2023. Stand approved as reported. Invoices paid report. It's recommended this report be received and placed on file. Council memo 1-23, regular payroll for November 18th through December 1st, 2022, $3,892,278.23. Council memo 2-23, regular payroll for December 2nd through December 15th, 2022, $3,618,061.26. Recommended said regular payrolls be approved. Council memo 3-23, award of contract for the Woodland Drive, Woodland Court retaining wall and channel improvements to deconstruction in the amount of $176,752.25. Council memo 4-23, award of contract for the 2022 roadways resurfacing contract E to PT payroll construction in the amount of $1,602,999.81. Council memo 5-23, award of contract for the public utilities electrical maintenance service 2023 to Elliott Electric in the amount of $294,774.40. Council memo 6-23, award of contract for the 2023 option for the 20. 22 biosolids contract to new arrow spreading in the amount of $1,535,100. Council memo 7-23, award of contract for the 2023 aluminum sulfate solution to Usalco, Michigan City Plant in the amount of $732,559.70. Council memo 8-23, award of contract for the 2023 manganese sulfate chemical to Keras Corporation in the amount of $345,119.04. 
Council Memo 9-23, award of contract for the 2023 sodium permanganate chemical to Karis Corporation in the amount of $401,011. Council Memo 10-23, award of contract for the 2023 bulk sodium bisulfite chemical purchase to Hawkins in the amount of $76,560. Council Memo 11-23, award of contract for the 2023 bulk sodium hypochlorite chemical purchase to Hawkins in the amount of $131,000. Council Memo 12-23, award of contract for the 2023 drinking water blended phosphate purchase to Hawkins in the amount of $141,000. Council Memo 13-23, award of contract for the 2023 drinking water sodium hypochlorite chemical purchase to Hawkins in the amount of $526,620. Council Memo 14-23, award of contract to Sierra ITS for information technology contract services in the amount of $150,000. Council Memo 15-23, award of contract to Heartland Business Systems for information technology contract services in the amount of $50,000. Council Memo 16-23, Amendment Number 1 to the Professional Services Agreement for the 2024 Water Main Rehabilitation Program for detailed design services to Baxter and Woodman in the amount of $1,462,100. It's recommended Council Memos 3-23 through 16-23 be approved. Is there a motion to approve all said consent agenda items? So moved. Second. In motion and seconded to approve. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Quillman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Motion carried. Moving on under agenda items, first is Council Memo 18-23, award of contract for the ductile iron pipe purchase for the 2023 water main replacement program in the amount of $2,376,270.80 on behalf of Underground Pipe and Valve, Mid-American Water, and Foreign Main based on the unit prices provided in their bids. It's recommended Council Memo 18-23 be approved. So moved. Second. In motion and seconded to approve, Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 19-23, award of contract for the Black Road Acres Phase 1 Water Main Improvement Project to lend Cox and Sons excavating in the amount of $4,652,581.16. <coughs> Council Memo 19-23 be approved. Motion approved. Second. It's been motion and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. <coughs> Motion carried. Council Memo 2020-23, award of contract for the Kate and Farm Road Water Main Improvement Project, PT Ferro Construction in the amount of $2,882,475.98. <coughs> it's recommended Council Memo 20-23 be approved. So moved. Second. Motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 21-23, award of contract for the Collins Street Water Main Improvement Project to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $5,989,498.45. <coughs> it's recommended Council Memo 21-23 be approved. So moved. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 22-23, award of contract for the Garnsey Park <coughs> Phase 4 Water Main Improvement Project to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $4,370,320.17. Recommended Council Memo 22-23 be approved. So moved. Second. It's been motioned and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Aye. Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 23-23, award of contract for the Highland Phase 1 Water Main Improvement Project to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $2,988,218. It's recommended Council Memo 23-23 be approved. Second. 
The motion seconded to approve. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Todd. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Pullman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 24-23, award of contract for the Joliet Ottawa Water Main Improvement Project to try and construction in the amount of $6,095,346. It's recommended Council Memo 24-23 be approved. So moved. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 25-23, award of contract for the Kerwin Terrace Water Main Improvement Project to Len Cox and Sons, excavating an amount of $3,684,106.41. Second minute, Council Memo 25-23, be approved. So moved. Second. In motion, seconded to approve. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Yes. Motion carried. Council Memo 26-23, award of contract for the Midland Avenue East Water Main Improvement Project to benchmark construction in the amount of $4,848,408. It's recommended Council Memo 26-23 be approved. So moved. Second. Second. In motion and seconded to approve, Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 27-23, award of contract for the Plainfield Road Water Main Improvement Project to try and construction in the amount of $4,792,653.07. It's recommended Council Memo 27-23 be approved. So moved. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 28-23, award of contract for the St. Pat's Phase 1A Water Main Improvement Project to Austin Tyler Construction in the amount of $3,880,229.76. It's recommended Council Memo 28-23 be approved. So moved. Second. In motion and seconded to approve. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 29-23, award of contract for the St. Pat's Phase 1B Water Main Improvement Project to construction by CAMCO in the amount of $5,204,225.28. Recommended Council Memo 29-23 be approved. Motion. Second. In motion and seconded to approve. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Motion carried. Next under licenses and permit applications. Council Memo 31-23 transfer of a Class C liquor license at 3001 West Jefferson Street, John Cartages. I believe the Deputy Liquor Commissioner, Kevin Kelly, is here to speak. Excuse me? First off, item 31-23 is an application for a transfer of a Class C liquor license at 3001 West Jefferson Street, John's Beverages. A Class C license authorizes the sale of packaged goods for consumption off the premises. There's currently a liquor license at this location operating as Joe's Beverage Warehouse. The applicant is a new owner who is seeking to transfer the existing license. The liquor commissioner is recommending approval of this license. So it's recommended that the Class C liquor license be approved for John's Beverage at 3001 West Jefferson Street. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Motion carried. Next item 32-23 is an application for a transfer of a Class C liquor license at 692 Theodore Street, Michaelines Liquors. Class C license authorizes sale of packaged goods for consumption off of the premises. There is currently a liquor license at this location. The applicant is a new owner who is seeking to transfer the existing license. 
The liquor commissioner is recommending approval of this license. The pin recommended the Class C liquor license be approved from Michelinas Liquors. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Pin motion seconded to approve. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hugg? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Rudin? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Motion carried. Next item 33-23 is an application for the issuance of a Class B liquor license at 16337 South Boulevard Place, the Olive Garden Italian Restaurant number 6475. A Class B license authorizes the services of alcoholic beverages for consumption on the premises. This is a newly constructed building that will open as an Olive Garden restaurant. The applicant has multiple other locations and is seeking the issuance of a new liquor license. The liquor commissioner is recommending approval of this license. So moved. We'll make the citizens of Joliet very happy. Second. <clears throat> Seconded to approve a Class B liquor license for the Olive Garden Italian Restaurant located at 16337 South Boulevard Place. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Fullman? I vote aye, but do we have an opening date yet, uh, City Manager, Mr. Jim? No, we do not. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Okay. No, I vote aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Motion carried. Next is item 34-23 is an application for a transfer of a Class B liquor license at 2771 Black Road, Fireman Ted's. A Class B license authorizes, authorizes the service of alcoholic beverages for consumption on the premises. There is currently a liquor license at this location. The applicant is a new owner who is seeking to transfer the existing license. The liquor commissioner is recommending approval of this license. Is there a motion to approve a Class B liquor license for Fireman Ted's at 2771 Black Road? So moved. Second. Second. Ten motion and seconded to approve Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Motion carried. Item 35-23 is an application for the issuance of a Class B liquor license at 214 North Ottawa Street, Renaissance Center Banquets. The Class B license authorizes the service of alcoholic beverages for consumption on the premises. The location has been an existing banquet hall for many years, and the new owners who currently own and operate five other restaurants in Joliet are seeking the issuance of a license to continue operating as a banquet hall. The liquor commissioner is recommending the approval of this license. Move to approve. Second. The motion seconded to approve a Class B liquor license for Renaissance Center Banquets at 214 North Ottawa Street. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Next, under public hearings, Council Memo 37-23 was previously tabled to the April 18th Council meeting. Uh, Chris, I have a question. Um, Jim, what was the reason why this was tabled all the way until April? Uh, that was on uh, the petitioner asked that it be tabled. So he, well, I would prefer, it's a controversial issue as we heard tonight. Um, if he wants to bring this forward, he should bring it forward as soon as possible. There's no reason to wait three months to take a vote on this. All right. If um Certainly, I'll be in contact with the petitioner, and I'll see if I if, if they're prepared to bring it forward. Now, I don't know why they asked for, for the, that particular thing, but certainly. Well, I, uh, I think we know why, and I think people know why, and so, you know. It, but they didn't indicate that, so. Yeah. But but absolutely, I'll, I'll contact them and see if they want to put it on the agenda item sooner rather. Yeah, it, it, I, I'm speaking for the whole council without speaking to the whole council. But again, it's controversial. People are upset about it. It should be brought forward and vetted publicly, and either voted up or voted down, so we can move forward. I mean, I, I believe the, the council, well, I, I think we can do that now if you wanted to. Is that, am I wrong? Well, I, I think you need to have a public hearing. Yeah, exactly. We have to have a public hearing. There are questions Absolutely. that were asked that right. need to be answered, and then the council should vote on it. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I, I know it was brought up maybe a couple of times, but I don't know if it's something, I don't recall the city ever doing it, of getting an independent person to come in. Because, I, I mean, me personally have had some concerns, you know, just about the facts of, you know, because there's something different, new, at least to me, blasting, you know, that close. So I don't know if that's something that can be done by the I mean, city uh, or we. 
Yeah, let me discuss with the petitioner. I mean, I don't have a Rolodex of blasting engineers on, on, on tap, but, but certainly if that's something that the council would like us to do, um, I can certainly uh, explore and get a uh, an independent blasting consultant if that's what you want. Yeah, I think one of the things that would come out of public hearing is what um, staff does review these and then they're brought forward to the council. Did staff get independent assessments of this or did they rely on the petitioner? I am sure that we Okay. So if, if you'd like to go, I, I'll be more than happy to, to, to um, get an independent, whatever, you know, uh, I'm here to, to, to make sure that you guys are, are happy. If you think that getting an independent third, uh, I'll be more than happy to do so. I would go along with that, Mayor. I think we need to vet this further. Yeah, I, again, there were points raised tonight that I agree with. Right. That was one of them, just to rely on the petitioner. I know nothing about blasting. There, there, are, there are three mines in Joliet that use blasting. So I'll, I'll reach out to those companies and see if they got somebody on, on you know, that they use that could give us an independent right. of, of uh, PT Ferros. Again, I think all of us could use some education on this. Sure. I, I know very little about it. Yeah, Mayor. And the other thing, too, I think the schools, uh, the school board should be notified of this because the two schools that are involved, they didn't know about it either. So, I mean, there's more than just the 600 feet around this particular area that it's going to affect. I, I, again, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I'd like someone to tell me how far these, these vibrations would be felt. I, I assume they're drilling into the ground and then blasting. How far underground do they go? I, I know nothing about this. Okay. Again, I, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to some of the uh, mining companies here in Joliet that are not involved with this so we can get an independent uh, and review their, their uh, statistics or whatever it is that they do to, to get a, a, a third set of eyes on it. Okay. Mayor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Jim, maybe the petitioner, we, we could find one and maybe they could pick up the bill. Sure. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, there, was, there was a point brought up, uh, concerns about the 600 foot radius of notification uh, and just kind of given the nature of the, the agenda item uh, that people outside of that 600 foot radius would also be impacted. So. I know we're we're required to notify people within the 600 feet, but it, would it be possible for on this instance uh, to extend that that notification radius? I also don't necessarily want to set a precedent of, you know, uh, increasing the, the notification radius for every public hearing. But I, I think in this particular instance, it might be warranted. All right, if we can uh, do a thousand feet, if that makes everybody a little bit more comfortable, or we can double it to 1,200 or 1,500. Um, that that starts to to make it fairly large, um, but uh, if you give me some guidance on what you feel comfortable with in the terms of, of the numbers, I'd be more than happy to do that, Council. Maybe start with the petitioner, see if they're willing to bring this forward. Okay. Okay. And then, like I said, we'll get we'll get I'll get some other um, in, input into this from the other mining companies here. Thank you, Mayor. Yes. Jim, can you check, is there anything in the federal government, like the, was it the National Geological Survey, is there anything there that would be even more independent that we might be relying on? I don't know if they'd be able to send somebody out here. To, I, I think that they just pr produced, the, the U.S. Geological Society would just produce the parameters of, uh, it, it's like the, the uh, FDA puts out the parameters of stuff they don't necessarily come out and, and would do an analysis here in this particular circumstances for a private entity. Um, so. Well, they would be doing it for us as a consultant or a friend of the council. Yeah. And I, mean, I, that's I figured... gonna, Right, exactly. But all of these things are going to just, if you want to put this on this, the agenda right away, the, these things are going to delay because the federal government moves not. I don't even know who to call. I mean, I, I can run it down, but it's going to take I'm just curious. Months. I mean, that would be completely kind of, you know, independent. And I'm assuming they have an expert. Maybe it's not feasible. I mean, they have I'm experts I'm sure they on... do have experts on... on uh, seismic activities, um, but like I said, we can, let me let me find out. Let me look in, into it a little bit more and, um, and and see what we can get from some of our uh, partners here in the city who currently blast uh, for mining. So I, I I don't think people realize that we do blast here already currently in the city of Joliet. So uh, let's let me reach out to some of those folks and find out what they do. Or what they used for a study so we can emulate that. Mayor. Yes. Um, I know that there's a quarry in Glenwood, Illinois, and they were they were blasting there because when we lived in Homewood, you could feel the vibration over there. So that might be something you might want to 
talk to those folks about that well, they're we, we, we have we have two quarries in Joliet that no right I'm just saying yeah. just somebody outside the area where there's residential around the quarries hi um, going to reach out to somebody else to get some more info okay thank you Next is Council Level 38-23, a public hearing for ordinance approving a vacation of small portions of Mound Road and Hobart Road right of way. This is a public hearing, so comments would be in order. At this time. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in this item? Seeing none, let the record show the hearing is now closed. It is recommended said ordinance be adopted. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Um, second. In motion, seconded to approve. Councilwoman Fullman. Councilwoman Coleman. I know. Give me the number because I lost my place. I was thinking about something else. 3823. I apologize. I Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Motion carried. Moving on under ordinances, Council Memo 40-23 ordinance, repealing designation of the 800 block of Western Avenue as the Rainers Edition Local Historic District. Recommended said ordinance be adopted. But question, uh, re reading through the documents, it seems that this was uh, sort of voluntary from the residents living on, on that block. Uh, were there were there any residents in the neighborhood who were opposed to this? Seems no, we, we I, I received no <clears throat> no indication that any of these residents uh, opposed the repeal of this. My name is Joe Trudy. I live at 814 Western. 100% of the homeowners and residents of the 800 block requested this. So thank thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's just my question. Okay. Motion to approve Council Memo 40 23. So moved. Second. In motion, seconded to approve Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Fullman. I will recuse myself from the vote. Motion carried. Next is Council Memo 41 23. Council Memo uh, and ordinances associated with Mound Road subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving a preliminary plat, an ordinance approving a final plat, and an ordinance approving a re recording plat of Mound Road subdivision. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. Motion to approve. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Motion carried. Council Memo 42-23, ordinances associated with Bravo Second Subdivision, a minor subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving a preliminary plat and an ordinance approving a recording plat of Bravo Second Subdivision, a minor subdivision. It's recommended said ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. The motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Motion carried. Next is Council Memo 43-23, ordinances associated with an indoor self-storage facility at 1735 East Cass Street. This includes an ordinance approving a variation of use to allow an indoor self-storage facility at B3 general business use in a B1 neighborhood business zoning district located at 1735 East Cass Street, and an ordinance approving a special use permit to allow an indoor self-storage facility located at 1735 East Cass Street. It's recommended that ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. In motion seconded to approve, Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Mudrin. Aye. Councilwoman Quillman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Motion carried. 
Council Memo 44-23 ordinances associated with the planned unit development for Rock Run Crossings Multifamily Subdivision. This includes an ordinance approving the final planned unit development and an ordinance approving the recording plat for Rock Run Crossings Multifamily Subdivision. It's recommended that ordinances be adopted. So moved. Second. It's been motion and seconded to approve. Councilman Hogg? No. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Pullman? Again, I'd rather see senior housing there, such as a condominium for our seniors, which are sorely needed, so I vote no. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Motion carried 6-2. Moving on under resolutions, Council Memo 46-23, a resolution denying a special use permit to allow an automobile storage lot for an existing used automobile sales business located at 115 North Center Street. Staff is recommending a resolution denying the special use permit be approved. Krista, um, Jim, we heard from both sides. Why is staff recommending a denial of this? We just felt that uh, the zoning board made good points on uh, their recommendation for de denial, and we were supporting the zoning board. Okay, thank you. I vote to deny. Second. The motion is seconded to approve a resolution denying a special use permit to allow an automobile storage lot for an existing used automobile sales business located at 115 North Center Street. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Pullman? Aye. Councilwoman Rudin? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? No. Councilman Hug? Aye. Motion carried 7 1. The special use permit was denied. Memo 47-23, a resolution incorporating motor fuel tax funds for the 2022 MFT roadway resurfacing contract E in the amount of $1,602,999.81. It's recommended said resolution be adopted. Motion approved. Second. In motion seconded to approve. Councilman Mudrin? Aye. Councilwoman Coleman? Aye. Councilwoman Reardon? Aye. Councilman Clement? Aye. Councilwoman Gavin? Aye. Councilman Guerrero? Aye. Councilman Hug? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Next is the city manager's report. Yes, I'd, I'd just like to touch on something. Earlier today, uh, we had Chief Carey in here talking about CPR. And um, I want to point out that uh, somebody uh, here uh, was able to put that to good use, and that was Pauline Ames, uh, our deputy city clerk. Uh, somebody collapsed, and I know she's embarrassed over there. But uh, she had attended the training. And she sprung into action, and she uh, was instrumental in, in uh, uh, helping that, that person uh, get through that, that uh, uh, cardiac event. So, uh, you know, you, you don't think that you're going to be able to use it, or at, at some point um, it'll come in, in handy. But uh, clearly, uh, here, here was somebody that took the time to attend the class, and uh, it paid dividends for that person who was saved. And, uh, and, and thank her. I'd like to thank her for having enough gumption to get up and, and uh, help somebody out because a lot of times people oh. just freeze. So, oh, thank you. You know what? Right? Mayor, she's embarrassed now. <laughs> Next is new business, not for final action. I think you should give her a challenge coin. I was yeah. going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe? Chet? New business? Oh, oh Betty? No, I am Caesar. Uh, just briefly, uh, anybody in the audience or watching at home might have noticed that agenda items 18 through 29 were voted separately. Uh, I had made that request of the city manager, I think almost a year ago now, that uh, contracts that are in the multi-million dollar range be voted on as, as our own items. Uh, so I apologize to my peers here in the council for making a long meeting that much longer, but I do think it's a, a small change that, that we can make that uh, just makes the, the process a little bit more transparent. 
uh, so that the you know uh, the public that we respond to knows that we are intentional and deliberate about the way that we are uh, spending what totals to be over $50 million in, in taxpayers' money. So we did look through this. Um, again, these, these are necessary expenses. Uh, water main replacements is, is going to be one of the uh, biggest projects that our city faces over the next few years. It, it is quite a bit of money, but it is something that's necessary. Um, but again, I, I just think that we have a responsibility to the public to be uh, intentional and, and deliberate about that. Um, so I was, uh, I was happy to see that, even if it does make us stay here a little bit longer. Thank you. Larry? I have nothing. Terry? Pat? Jim? Not Terry? Nothing. No. Next is public comments. Is there anyone that would like to address the council time on any topic? <clears throat> uh, back up um, to talk about... Um, um, 3023. I, when this was first brought to uh, the council in December, it was up for vote. And I did, when I saw it on the agenda, I, I asked myself, how did this get this far? How did it get to a, the agenda? Why? Why is this item on the agenda in the first place? And then it was, you know, it was, it was tabled after, you know, concerns were voiced, it was tabled. And then it was tabled, you know, a second, a second time. And I was going to come back up here and ask, you know, tonight, why? And the mayor asked the question before I did, because I was wondering, okay, nobody's telling us why this uh, item is, uh, why it's tabled. So, I, I, I just, I, I'm just, I'm very disappointed because there were people here to speak because they thought that it was and was told it would be on the agenda. And then to have, Jen, you say to the people, to have you say to the people, you can go home because it's not coming up again to April. But when people are gone, you guys, Sit up here when it came up, you, you had a discussion. And some of you were saying, you know, you truly didn't know what it, you know, it entail and everything. I, that, that's really a shame. It's a shame for an item like this to get this far, to be voted on, and then you guys don't fully understand what it is that you're voting on. Blasting in our city in a residential area. And it's sad that people were here that wanted to say something and was told to go home. And I'm very disappointed because they thought it was, it was done, it was tabled. But then there was discussion from you guys on this item. Mayor, Ms. Satcher, may I please speak to you for one second, please? Ms. Satcher. The reason I said that, I knew people were coming here. I didn't want them to sit here all night and wait that's why I said, once it's table, we're not supposed to discuss it. But you did. But, excuse me, I didn't know that we were going to because once it's done, you're not supposed to do it, but it was allowed because the people were here. And I wanted to explain to them if they were going to stay all night, it was not going to be discussed because it was tabled. That's why I said what I said. So I'm sorry if you misunderstood that. But I hate it for everybody. I mean, we've been here for two hours, and I didn't want folks to have to sit here. And then it was changed. But once a thing is tabled, we're not supposed to discuss it anymore. But, but you guys the, did. But at the end, yes, but I, unbeknownst I, to me, ma'am, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, well, thank you. We can't ask you guys questions, but then you guys can ask us questions. Thank you. What was it tabled? It was tabled. At the request of the petitioner. No, I say, when was the, the petitioner before called? Comments. The petitioner called today and asked comments. that it be tabled. That was today. Right. Which, which I asked when the issue came up. So yeah, I, I wasn't going to interrupt any speakers. Um, you know, technically it was off the agenda, but we let everyone talk anyways. But um, yeah, when the issue, when when we got to that point of the agenda, that's when I raised the issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm John Johnson, and I'm about the the blasting. I live at 524 Strong, 
and I represent Shalino Cheese, Topps Dairy Products, right across the street from my house. We are totally against it because of the age of the buildings in that area. And what I saw tonight here, what you did I thought was very good by questioning your city manager, because the way I understood it, he said, well, we don't have to have a public hearing. We can vote on it tonight. That was the way it sounded to me. Well, I was up for a public hearing tonight, so th there wouldn't have been an up or down vote. So well, that's what hearing. you brought up. When? And that makes me very nervous. Yeah, no, it was on, on the agenda. I know for it was on hearing. the agenda for a public hearing, but after that was all done and we told it, we were told it was tabled, and then when it, you brought the discussion up again where you wanted to find out more about it and you were speaking with him, and the way it sounded to me was, well, we could do the vote on it now. Yeah, that, that was not correct. If you said that, that's incorrect. I, I, I said that it was completely erroneous. Right. Okay, well, I just, uh, when, after I heard that, I got nervous that something was going on. But I think you guys are on the right track by trying to figure out what is happening in a blasting zone. I lived in Thornton, and you've got about a two-mile radius if you're on a limestone base, which we are, for vibrations to go through. I worked at Stone City VFW in the quarry out there. They blasted every day at 3 o'clock, and it was two and a half miles away, and the Stone City VFW shook, and that's a solid brick building. So there is ramifications from the blasting. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. your time. You're welcome. Jewel Houston, Eastside Community Council again. All right. This issue was discussed and brought up several months ago. My question to this council is why did you even let it get to this point? These questions we asked tonight was addressed before, but nobody seemed to have paid any attention to them then. If you had taken our suggestion and got some of these answers, we wouldn't be at this particular point in time. So you, as council members and people here in the city of Joliet need to listen when people are speaking to you, not just trying to brush us off because we're saying something that you do not want to hear. So take the time to investigate concerns of your citizens when they are brought to you and we will not have another catastrophe like we had here today. And as it stated, you guys or your city management or whatever got information from them, but it was never released to the public. The people that it was that it would be concerned about it. That is not a way to govern. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? Seeing none, next is Mayor Council comments. Joe. Betty. Yeah. Caesar. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, over the weekend, I attended the Afri African American Business Association's uh, brunch in, in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Councilman Plummet was also there, Mayor uh, Councilman Morris. Um, very, very well uh, put together event. Happy to attend. Uh, I unfortunately was not able to join Monday when I believe there was over 100, close to 200 students from our uh, Joliet High Schools who uh, volunteered to, to construct a home for Habitat for Humanity. Uh, so I just want to send my uh, congratulations. I want to commend those students who volunteered that day. And also, I, I think I speak for everybody on, on uh, the council when you know we say that, that our heart breaks for Maya Smith. Uh, may she rest in peace. and. Uh, our prayers go out to the family and for, for the child. Larry? Nothing. Terry? Yeah, yeah. Pat? No. Jim? No. Sure you know. Uh, a couple of things. Um, number one, I want to thank Councilwoman Quillman, Councilman Hug, and our city clerk. On uh, January 9th, we conducted the election board hearings. 
Um, that's the first that's happened since I've been there. I don't know if it happened prior. It's been the first since I think I've been on the council. All right. So, um, but the hearing, they've done well, staff, Sabrina Spano. Um, but thank you, council people, for stepping up and doing that. Um, the same day on January 9th, there was a ribbon cutting at 3033 West Jefferson, uh, the place for children with autism. Um, Again, I, I don't know if we have another site in Joliet that's set up only for autistic children. These are children prior to entering school uh, to get them the, the social skills and the life skills to be able to participate in school. Um, they're very, very well-run place. I was very impressed by the staff over at, at the, the place for children with autism. They already have a waiting list to get in. Uh, they've been open here about a month. So congratulations to them. Um, on the 11th of January, myself, Councilman Mudrin, Councilwoman Reardon, Councilman Clement, and Councilman Morris all participated, um, as was said earlier, with the Easter Seals, the CDBG check that was given by the City of Joliet, as well as the Will Grundy Medical Clinic, the funds that were also given by the City of Joliet. And I do want to thank uh, Christy McNichols. She's not here tonight, our staff member. She's done an excellent job since you brought her on, Jamie, coordinating this. Probably was an area that the city was lagging. Um, this type of social service or keeping, uh, uh, I guess, a handle on the different agencies that we work with. So I think she's done a great job. I think the council people all saw that day uh, how professional she is. <clears throat> so thank you. And then finally, um, Saturday, as, as Councilman Guerrero said, the MLK brunch was at the local 176 hall put on by the African American Business Association. Really was an interesting program with the four way forum that went on. But um, congratulations and thank you to them for that. And then yesterday at Joliet Central High School, it had been a three-year lapse, but we had the Joliet area MLK Day of Service kick back into gear. Um, there were several hundred high school students here, as well as a number of other uh, community volunteers that chose on the day off to come and, and do public service work for their community. So thank you to everyone involved in that. It was a great day. It's great to be back um, post-COVID to see things like that come back. So that's all I have for tonight. No executive session, correct? There is a short Motion to go into closed session to discuss yes. personnel, collective bargaining, land acquisition, or conveyance pending or threatened litigation. Yes, which the meeting will be adjourned. I'll move. Second. The motion seconded to approve. Councilwoman Coleman. Aye. Councilwoman Reardon. Aye. Councilman Clement. Aye. Councilwoman Gavin. Aye. Councilman Guerrero. Aye. Councilman Hug. Aye. Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Lundgren. Aye. 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 A